everybody. Uh, we've come in back from the break. During the break, Michael McAndrew or Deepak, somebody was going to ask about uh, test functions that are useful helpers uh, when you're writing a test in Civi. Um, so if you're using the bare bones uh, PHP unit framework, all you get is assert equals and a handful of other generic assertions. If you're working within Civi, um, in the core repository, you will usually be extending a class called Civi Unit Test Case, which adds a bunch of other assertions and helper functions. The coolest one, in my opinion, is probably this guy, call API success. What this does is save us a few lines of code. You can say Civi CRM API contact get, uh, create params plus debug. And then you say this assert equals, uh, I guess you do assert empty, result error message. <coughs> so it's, I mean, two lines with a lot of intricate stuff, or it's the one line to call API success. <clears throat> Eileen, are there other helper functions that are really yeah, useful? Suppose it's a git count, there's a git count variant, there's a git value variant, there's a git single variant. Ah, yes. So our IDE gives a whole bunch of tips there. On um, with that, does, the, does it, uh, I was presuming that you'd need to pass like the result to that in a, um, so the result will be returned from call API success. So that that's the API result. Are you result. talking about his earlier hardware version where he forgot to write? Well, I guess I was thinking course. if you are, if, you know, like you've you've created a contact. Yeah. I'm just wondering how how do you do it? Like you create you do something and create some entity, then you want to maybe check that the entity has some field yeah. set to particular values. So it's is returned to the contact if you do. Yeah, so there's an example where there's a field that's being returned with an ID. The ID actually varies. It, it's kind of unpredictable what the ID so number that, will be. So that's for just for, for, check, for checking the API? It just checks that it's a success, so it means you don't have to, on the next line, check that it's a success, and you don't have to add debug equals one to every single mm -hmm. line as well. Um, it, it sort of handles the presentation of the error a little bit if it's not a success as well. Yeah, if you do this guy with just contact create, then the error can get returned in different ways and it might not be very pretty. So it's just another way to call the API. That's just another way to call the API. Yes. Within the test. In a test, test. friendly way, yeah. Oh, it's, it's a test specific one. Yeah. Yeah. And you should probably explain what the call API and document is and so they don't need to call it 20 times per inch. <laughs> so Eileen is pointing out that there are five or six different variations of call API. One of them is call API in document, which is a fairly special one that will check the uh, data that you're passing through and then record the data that's being passed out and create an example file that reflects those. So we can see those examples under... API v3 examples, contact, get. This shows a rendered example with the same params that were used in a unit test, and then the same results that were produced by that unit test. It's kind of edge casey, uh, but it's The reason neat. I mentioned this is because people often copy and paste, so like, we do deliberately take uh, yeah. those examples and display them in the API Explorer, and that gives people a way to call them. It maybe does display some different ways of calling the API. But we do see that people tend to copy and paste 
that function and then you just kind of get into example fighting where it's, you know, you're not deliberately trying to write an example but it overrides the last person's yeah. example and so yeah, it's it's something to use if you want to generate an example for people to see how to use it, but don't copy and paste it blindly. But I guess so that's useful for testing the API, but if you'd written another function that you wanted to unit test, yeah. that wouldn't be useful. No, it's entirely for the API. Can we use these local functions and extension? I have a theory that we should write a test extension that exposes all the things that we have. Um, so, for your question, can we use the example functions in an extension? Is that asking about whether we can produce documentation in the same style, like produce examples, or? Yeah, the first one, that CV unit test case file has those. Ah, I'm right. Those helper functions are only executable. Correct. Uh, so the helper functions are inherited from this class, so the unit test case. Uh, as Deepak points out, and in core, there's a convention of extending this class. Right. For extensions, we actually tend to do it a little bit differently. Let's see what the, let's make a test in an extension. Let's right. do that quickly. Uh, so that ge <laughs> generate module or that example dot test me. Right, and let's generate a test. Uh, when you generate a test with civics, there are a couple options, and you need to know about that headless versus end-to-end -end discussion that we had earlier to generate the appropriate temp uh, from the appropriate template. So we're going to do a headless one, which is dash dash template. equals headless. And then what do we say? CRM test me uh, contact names test dot PHP. No, no dot PHP. Let's read the example. The example here shows just a class name, just underscores. Okay, now we can take a look at that file which was called contact names test dot PHP contact name. All right, so here's the boilerplate that's produced. This actually extends the basic PHP unit class. Um, oh, yeah. Here. So there's a reason why I have this um, in civics extending the most basic class called test case rather than extending the same base here, right? And the reason is that civi unit test case actually does some fairly aggressive things to reset the database. And those may not always make sense in an extension. In, it, if you try to disable them, then you have to spend a lot of time tracing through what's going on in that class and how it manages. Whereas if you start out from the t this test case, then you can mix in extra features and remove those features as needed. So, for example, this mixes in headless interface, which means that we need to run within the headless database and it will check for that. It mixes in hook interface, which means that we can add a function like uh, public function hook civi CRM post of, uh, what is it, name object ID, and we just implement the hook. It also has transactional interface, which means that the entire test gets wrapped up inside a database transaction, and at the end of the test, it will roll back and remove any changes that you've done. This performs faster than trying to manually delete the records. Um, it's not appropriate in every test. If your test manipulates the schema, creating new custom fields, deleting custom fields, then transactions don't work. But most of the time, uh, you can use transactions. So the, the neat thing about this structure is that you can just delete that if it's inappropriate. Um, 
But what's missing here, I, which I think was Deepak's sort of original leading question, is that the helper functions like this call API success, that's not coming up because that's not part of the base. What I would like to do is introduce a new trait here and say something like use civi test trait. That doesn't exist right now. Um, it doesn't exist because we still need PHP 5.3 compatibility. And if we just put that code in the code base, then some things crash when we're testing on PHP 5.3. This test is also a little interesting in that it adds a function called setup headless. And setup headless has this thing about install me dir. What that means is on the headless database, we're going to install the current extension before executing the test. If we depend on other extensions, we can say install org.civicrm.volunteer. And it will try to install that before executing the test. And if we use our autocomplete, there's a whole bunch of other things that we can do as part of the setup. Um, so I wanted to do an example of a test uh, that involves names. If you've worked with the API before, you've probably noticed that you can create a contact with contact type equals individual, and you give a first name equals Alice, right? Pretty simple. But then if you create a contact type equals organization, first name Alice doesn't make any sense. It needs to be organization name Alice. And there's several different combinations we get based off of those fields. So first I want to make a quick mental note about what those fields are. Uh, there's contact type, which is going to be individual household, or organization. There's first name, last name, middle name. Uh, there's nickname, legal name, organization name. Uh, house yeah, I don't know what it is for household. So, household, name. household name, all right, that's good. <laughs> there's also a prefix. So I assume you don't have Mr. Amnesty International, but you do have Mr. and Mrs. for uh, the other things. Sort name and display name. So display name, sort name. and sort name. Suffix. Prefix and suffix. Is that as well? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, date of birth and job title don't show up in your name for the most part. <laughs> so this is quite a space of things that we can mess up, right? Um, and let's just, let's do something simple, like if we create a contact, uh, oh, you know what, it's really handy to have that call API success, so I'm gonna make it entity action params data equals And our message will be failed to call entity dot action. All right, so we're just going to test individual. Oh, good point. Return data. Um, and then result equals this call API success, contact 
create array. And we want first name Alice, last name Allison, contact type individual. And we want to make an assertion uh, that her display name. Oops. So her name is supposed to be Alice Allison, which comes from result. All right. I wonder if that's going to work. So failed asserting that an integer is empty. What line of code did that happen on? Right here. OK, so let's put a breakpoint in and see what's going on. Maybe I've got a mistake in how I wrote that function. Execute the test again. Probably want to look at our debug console. All right, so we've got action entity params. That looks right. Result. Oh, so there's a mandatory field missing. And what else? Version. So let's try this again. All right, so what's our result? Our result is error is zero. Some values there. OK, if we continue execution. What do we get? We get a failure with an assertion. Undefined index error message. Ah, that's a good point. So there's, um, the function that we're calling here, assert empty, takes uh, some kind of data or condition that we're going to check, and then a message, right? And we're constructing the message to pass in. To construct that, we're using this field, but the field might not exist. If the API test actually, if the API call actually succeeded, then that field doesn't exist. So we just need to do this a little more carefully. Uh, CRM. <laughs> right. We need to wait for holiday just break for a moment. Oops. Let's get rid of that. It's called like four thousand times every time you load a function. Yeah. yeah. Should be result instead of data. Oh, oh, good point. Well, in fairness, it's used in a lot of places where it's not appropriate. Yeah. But this is a place where the extra guards and conditionals that it has is actually appropriate. Well, it's not used so many places where it's not appropriate after this week. All right, and what's our result? The result looks OK. Yeah. 
undefined index trace. Okay, same mistake. Okay, and the smart thing to do would have been to open up call API success from somewhere else and copy and paste it or create that trait so that we can actually mix it into our test class. All right, so now we're getting somewhere. Now we're here and we're saying display name is not returned. Well, what is returned? I bet you guys know what my mistake is already. But we'll see the mistake when we look here. So it's result display name. And there is no result display name. You have to go into values and then number three. And then display name ought to be in here. There it is. And this is when tool API success gets some numbers nice. <laughs> so. A neat trick, um, PH, when I made this mistake here, PHP Storm underlined that variable because the variable wasn't defined yet. What's our result? Values three. So display name is in there, but it's empty. So I'm vaguely pessimistic. That's because you need to do something to refresh when you, if you want to pause parameters. Ah. Create. I don't know what it is, but I know you do. So Eileen is pointing out that the API call by default returns the inputs that you provided as opposed to reloading from the database with the actual record that was produced. So we can... Uh... <laughs> I think that's the one. Well, that's running. I'm going to go. Uh, can I go online? No, I cannot go online. Do you mind if we record your Wi-Fi password no. for all the ages? It's <laughs> 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 yeah. Which one? Okay. Actually, this is kind of weird that the test isn't finishing. I've been connected to it before. Yeah. All right, that's okay. We don't need that. We have grep. go. 
Ah, there's the notation. Oh, no, wait, reload invalid, no. Reload, yeah. <laughs> reload one. <laughs> What's a little alarming here is that the tests aren't outputting results. I think my IDE and test runner have gotten a little bit munged. So I'm just going to delete all of these. Now I'll do debug. Yeah, okay. We'll do it yet. Even then, it's not working. Do we have a bug? <laughs> But there's got to be a default, right? Yeah, I think it's last comma first is the yeah. default, which would make the test fail. But that right, but it. That's the way that yeah. Which, which Maybe it's just not, is it not really bad? Just got first. What about with adding it as a return, return display name? Good idea. Like that? Can you look in the database at the display name? Yeah, let's try that. So uh, to look in the database, we probably want to get rid of this thing. Mm. I guess maybe there might be some trigger which displays, or says to display. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That would be bad. 
<laughs> so it's not in the database. <laughs> well, okay. Um, so we have a legitimate failure. We can go in and try to fix this, or we can document out some other things uh, the way we expect them to work. Create some more tests. Yeah. We'll do data provider. OK. So we're going to assume that this code for the test is basically right. I mean, we're getting the contact, doing the assertion. And what happens if we want to do a different permutation where we provide a prefix? And the prefix is Dr. Alice Allison. Right? Then her name is supposed to be like that. OK, so we need to call this another function, test individual with prefix. And if we wanted to do the same thing with an organization, we would say test organization and organization. And we'd change some of these values. Good organization. So now we'd have three tests, and they all look very repetitive. Uh, the only thing we've changed in them is the data in here and the data in here. Right? So we, that's a lot of code duplication. Let's not do that much code duplication. Let's go back, and this thing is one variable that is under test. So creation params, or let's say create params. There's another thing, which is the expected name. And as long as those two variables, everything else is boilerplate. So what's neat is that we can say those two variables are actually inputs, the create params and the expected name. And we can define them somewhere else. So public function get test cases. Uh, cases equals an array. So the first time we call it, we're going to pass in this value as create params. We're going to pass in this value as the expected name. So now we have one fairly generic function if we execute the tests again, it's going to fail. But it'll fail for the right reason, because there's some kind of bug underneath. Oh, wait, no. It says missing argument 1. Uh-oh. So I made this function with the data and this function, but they're not connected. So let's wire them together with at data provider get test cases. Which means that PHP unit will call this function, get the results, and for each item in the results, call this function. I was um, a little bit confused as to, as to why, um, like I can, I can see that it's sort of, yeah, if you make it a function that's going to return an array, then you could do a lot of work in getting that array together. Yeah. But, but quite often, those functions are just return array, and it's like a, an array of data. And I, I, 
or go what's what's the benefit of, of using that um, system instead of like for each and there's your array and then go through. Okay, so the question is, what's the benefit of doing these as two separate functions rather than a for each and going through? So an example of how you might do that, you'd get rid of that guy and you'd say the test helper. And then you just have a control function, test all, for each this get test cases as case. Or, or that does the same thing. Or even just, you only need one function. You can just have that test function ah. so for, for each loop. And so you're, you're saying uh, deconstruct it even further. Just and move that there, move that that's the sort of, there. That's the sort of thing for, you know, for each, and there it is. Like so now it's a longer function, right, which has test all, sort of one subsection, which is about finding the data, and another subsection, which is about looping through the data. Um, personally, I try to do more single responsibility for functions. So it's one responsibility to figure out the array of data. It's a different responsibility to um, actually work with the data. And if we go undo and go back to our original structure, So what's neat about this is that data provider can be a function, but it can be other things as well. It can be an XML file or a CSV file. So actually you can, um, if you have a whole bunch of permutations mm -hmm. and you have other people who are maybe less technical, who are involved in examining those permutations, they can work on it as a CSV file and then you plug that into the process. So if you've got 50 permutations, then using the for each function will only test up to the first failure. And when you get the report that shows these are the failures and these are the tests, it's nice to see that 49 of them are working, but this one specific one failed. Or to see that 40 of them are working and 10 of them failed. Like that can help you identify where the change was that caused the failure. Can they be reused in different passes? Is it they can. Um, well, okay, they can, they can be reused in different tests. So we could have one test that um, does this with API version 3 and a different test that does it with API version 2. Uh, I think I'm, I'm thinking, do you, are there any global data providers that are useful to plug into your tests? Uh, Would that be useful? Um, so the closest example I can think of to a global data provider is in syntax conformance test, but it's not a global data provider the way you're describing. Rather, it is a data provider that gets used a whole lot. So syntax conformance test is a very generic test, and if you make a new API, you're very likely to hit a failure in syntax conformance test. Um, its purpose is to ensure that uh, every API function, whether it's contact or group or event or anything, you do a get action and you just give ID one. That should always be legitimate with any API. And so that's done with a data provider where you have function get entities, which is going to return the array of contact group event dot 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 function test get by ID for the entity. Um, and this function get entities is used 
a huge number of times. So there's, I don't know, 20 or 30 of these uh, test cases which are built off of that data. So do you believe that they provide a decorator? You do. I think, you know, maybe there might be a whole list of contacts and if you're testing a function to send an SMS or something, you can yeah. see, does it work with all, you know, maybe that's the, yeah. a useful data provider. The DJ stuff uses data providers, like the DJT thing uses data providers quite a lot to test all the variations of every single of And they're in, those, those are, they're sort of, that's in DJ. So could you, you could use that in some other function? No, it's in the DJ <coughs> test class, but, oh, what you can use in another function is the build test object. That's an it's a good thing to know about. Um, another helper function provided by Civi Unit Test Case is called this create test. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, no, I don't like that one. No. I like create test object. And what you can do is something like create a CRM member BAO membership and when you call this it will create the membership and the contact record and the organization record and it will link them all together. It crawls the foreign keys basically. Does it create new ones of each? Yeah, yeah. And then it returns it in that. <coughs> it's probably not quite as clever in the combinations you can do as the CV pop that you demoed. Uh, but it does some variations. All right, how are we doing for time? 11.35. Um, rather than launch into some other thing, do we want to do just a couple Questions, see if there's anything. Is there an example for testing JS? Ah, an example for testing JS. Mm -hmm. In the core code base, if we go into our tests folder, we see several folders. One is for PHP unit, and another one is Karma. And that's probably the best one to look at. Um, to run a Karma test, you do Karma A. Uh, Karma start. <coughs> this actually creates a headless web browser, loads the JavaScript file, and executes tests inside there. If you edit the JavaScript file, so in this case, uh, what, what are some tests that we have in there? Tests karma. Let's go to unit. So CRM case type spec. Let's open that guy. It's a whole lot of JavaScript code. Let's put something like um, just some nonsense. What happens if we put that in? We can go back to our window where we did karma start. And we see the old run is there. But the watcher detected a change in our file, CRM case change case type spec, ran it again, and now there's a failure. Specifically, it can't find this symbol. That's a good point. You can't find that symbol. So if we said wind, uh, maybe console.log, hello world, we go back here. It detects the change again, runs the tests, and reports success. Uh, for Karma, I would just suggest Googling on Karma. The AngularJS docs include a lot of examples of working with Karma. How would you go about doing other UI tests? Like, other UI is still working on web. Like, if your extension is injecting something to the UI, is it still working? So the question is, how would we do other UI-level tests? Um, 
principle, you can, in core, work with the web test suite, which has code, what's a general click around test? So in the web test suite, everything begins with this prefix. It extends civi selenium test case, and then it's got a whole bunch of things like click on this element in a page and click on this other element in a page. Wait for something to show up on the screen. Uh, you can definitely write code like this. Personally, I find this code a bit difficult to read, and I wouldn't try to hold other developers to meeting web test as their standard in writing their own extensions. So my suggestion would be to go read about another test framework, like Codeception or Behat or Mink, because they generally have more thinking and better explanations about how to work with that kind of scenario. And if you follow their documentation, and if you know how to use CVPHP boot, then you can load your CiviCRM instance as part of that test system. Uh, Is there an example somewhere out there where, where you've done that? No. Oh, yeah. I would try for me, Chris Burge as well, I see, or check to see what he, how far he got. Chris and Nicholas Ganovich have tried, so Actually, come to think of it, Testapalooza does have an example of using codeception. Um, it's not a very well-developed example. It's pretty thin, but it's there. All right. Ah, yes. So there are a handful of links that are available um, that are relevant. My favorites are probably going to be this Testapalooza page, which introduces the general concepts of Civi with any test framework. And then the last two links talk about the specific tests that are within Civi Serum Core. All right, I think that's about it then.